Warning, this episode would make Elmo faint. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the infant coffin for the anti-vax parent on the go. Told you so's. Told you so's. Maybe you should have Googled. And now, The Scathing Atheist. My name is Natalie, and I live in Lincoln, Nebraska, home of the devil hands. If my degree in anthropology taught me anything, it's that one, you can't get a job in anthropology, and two, we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. It's January 23rd. And it's Measure Your Feet Day. <laughs> so, uh, go ahead and take Quentin Tarantino up on that offer, I guess. Might as well. <laughs> yeah, right. It's the day for it. I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Measles Friendly, New Jersey. God damn it. Cincinnati's <laughs> Fixed, Good Husband, Georgia. This is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Trump is ready to make America pray again. Coach Dave wants the Duchess of Sussex to exit through a separate door. Oh, God. And it'll turn out that Australia was just on fire for Jesus this whole time. Ooh. But first, the diatribe. When I was in my 20s, I had a job for a while as a fry cook at Applebee's. And that job fucking sucked. But the boss was pretty cool. I worked a morning shift. And if we got all our prep work done before the restaurant opened, he would look the other way. If the kitchen crew went out back and smoked a couple of joints before the lunch rush started. He was also pretty cool about not noticing it if we maybe, you know, took a meal home at the end of our shifts once in a while. But then this dude named Jack started working there. And he fucked it up for everybody. Right. He, he would like make it look like his prep work was done and then spend an hour outside smoking blunts. He'd take home a lunch that consisted of 27 chicken strips and four orders of fries. And we kept telling him he was going to ruin this shit for all of us, but the asshole wouldn't listen. And pretty soon we had to cook tequila lime chicken sober all damn afternoon. And I only mention this because having been privy to those failed interventions with Jack, I recognize and appreciate the tone of a recent warning from Ministry Watch about the disturbing trend of evangelical charity organizations pretending to be churches for the purposes of taxation. Underneath its thin veil of solicitude and moral apprehension are the unmistakable tones of don't fuck this up for the rest of us. So the piece I'm talking about here is an op-ed by Warren Cole Smith, the head of Ministry Watch, titled When a Church is Not a Church. And basically, it highlights the increasing number of institutions that were nonprofits for the purposes of taxation a few years ago and suddenly became churches under Trump's watch. The main difference between those two designations, of course, is the annual Form 990. It's basically a tax return for a nonprofit organization that's publicly available. It forces nonprofits to declare their income and their expenses, including a breakdown of their administrative fees and their salaries. But if you're designated as a church rather than a nonprofit, you don't have to file that shit or anything like it. You know, and, and if you want to be charitable and give Ministry Watch the benefit of the doubt, you can commend this piece for bringing this problem to the fore in such a way that it would end up getting discussed in the New York Times and the Washington Post. But if you're less lenient in your interpretation, you might notice the way it tries to hijack the conversation. Right? Like, sure, it points out the problem, but this is a problem that's been pointed out before. It also arms the offenders with plenty of bullshit, plausible deniability. For example, it tries to heap a little blame on secular groups who have publicized the charitable donations of prominent people to their own detriment. Right. Like uh, uh, th think about the dude that founded Mozilla and then got pushed out when his donations to, to Proposition 8 came to light. And, and in Smith's view, that's a, quote, despicable practice engaged in by unscrupulous bullies, end quote. You know, because how dare people publicly associate you with yourself? And, and, and citing this excuse, he points out that many of these groups are probably changing their designation so that they can, you know, keep their bigotry funded privately. You know, so it's our fault. And, and as bad as that excuse is, it's not even fucking true. The IRS has already bent over backwards to make sure bigot groups can keep their donors' names private. He, he also needs to justify the continued ability of churches to hide their own finances one way or the other. And here's the best he can do. Quote, 
Churches have leadership and members who live in community with each other. Almost all donors come from within that community. Whatever transparency and accountability are necessary will be provided by the rules and structures of the church. The government has no business interfering in a church's internal affairs, end quote. And yes, that is just a long series of non sequiturs followed by not a point, followed by the exclamation of a drunken sovereign citizen at a DUI checkpoint. But it also ignores the fact that 10 percent of the churches account for 50 percent of the church attendance because Christians can't even make up bad arguments without lying. But I'll be damned if both of those flimsy ass defenses weren't dutifully parroted in all the mainstream articles that I saw that referenced this piece and talked about this problem. Right. But the real impetus for all this shows up at the bottom of his piece. And surprise, surprise, it's got nothing to do with his genuine concern for America's philanthropists. It's the fact that a mainstream candidate for president dared to broach the subject of making churches play by the same fucking rules as all the other nonprofits. And that has them terrified. Right. So people like Warren Cole Smith go out and bluster a bit about how very concerned that they are, that people are taking advantage of this otherwise very reasonable tax benefit as a smokescreen whilst never bothering to justify the damn thing in the first place. Look, when Christians come out from any fucking where and fight for this thing, they know good and fucking well that they're primarily fighting for Joel Osteen's mansion, Creflo Dollar's plane and John Gray's wife's car. Right. They're not even fighting to keep money. They get to keep the money either way. They're fighting for the right to lie about that money later. And there is no honest reason to fight for that. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast and bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the blood and sweat to my tears. Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, <laughs> are you ready to excrete? What goes up, Noah, must come down. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Do you also shit tears? I thought it was just me, but no, this is cool. The, was, what would make them tears? No. It's a reference to a sweet blood, sweat, and tears song, Spinning Wheel. Oh, nailing oh it. I see. I thought you were throwing those things into the air. Okay. That's <laughs> better. Uh, be both. better. I am Keats. In our lead story tonight, <laughs> it was National Religious Freedom Day last week. So Donald Trump celebrated by making a big announcement that he's making a new rule to protect the rights of every kid to pray in school mm -hmm. because he's an idiot and we already have that. And Christian people got super excited because they're idiots and somehow they didn't know we already <laughs> had that. Right. Yes. At this point, he's promising them the inside of a pot in every pot, and they're cheering wildly. <laughs> Next, I'm going to give back all the guns that Obama took from you. <laughs> right, yes. All of them will Actually, go back. That's... <laughs> you, you might do that one. <laughs> and uh, just to be clear, this story is about Donald Trump, so it's definitely worse than just benign stupidity. He didn't manage right. to hit that lofty goal of benign <laughs> stupidity. And that's because the still allowed to pray directive was accompanied by some other rules and guidance memos that actually will have an effect and they're going to funnel government money into religion. So bad stuff too, obviously. But all the Christian people had definitely stopped paying attention after that first part about the praying that they already had and started legally spite praying right in our atheist faces in celebration <laughs> big win for them yeah no i will we'll all be way fucked if one of them thinks of you know using a prayer in schools to pray for more prayers in schools <laughs> luckily <laughs> yeah so so far again the school praying thing it's a giant pile of nothing but that didn't stop trump from inviting a bunch of christian kids to the oval office for his weird theatrical like ribbon cutting ceremony to commemorate yeah. <laughs> the nothing and <laughs> these kids were allegedly victims of you know all the atheist teachers who walk around school slapping bibles out of kids hands <laughs> and yelling in their faces and <laughs> blasting gitmo dubstep atheism music to drown out their praying and torture and all that stuff so apparently for just the price of a cup of coffee a day, you can sponsor a prayer-starved Christian kid in America's heartland. I can just imagine the ads now. They like they pick a fly off of some white kid's face and put it on a black kid's face. There we fuck. go. Yeah, 
he might as well have invited Covington Catholic on the grounds that if you freeze halfway through a tomahawk chop, you're basically praying. You know, he's like, uh-uh. you got to catch him on the downswing. You're being negative. Yeah. <laughs> Christians are being persecuted by one Native American guy at a parade. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's right. And, and of course, Donald Trump can't hold a Vince McMahon style persecution skit. Without the help of his white power spiritual advisor and nip tuck Barbie, Paula White. <laughs> she was there. And also appearing in the skit was Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos. She will be continuing her job of fixing our overfunded public school system. And <laughs> she'll also be reminding Paula White what she'd look like without constant surgical intervention and aggressive personal irrigation. So that's what. <laughs> Betsy will be doing. Fun fact, Paula White, Betsy Devos, Would You Rather is the only game where an acceptable answer is put bees in your pee hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and how many bees can I fit in my pee hole? But other than that, you know, yeah. that's fair. That is fair. <laughs> Withdrawn. It's like Chubby Bunny. It's a weird version of Chubby Bunny. <laughs> and in Wild Wild West news tonight, whoever had zero seconds in the how long till newly Christian Kanye West promotes dangerous bigots bull just won a lot of money. Uh, all of us. It was, we all won lost to that pool. Indeed it was. And that was a safe fucking bet because last week, Kanye West and his Sunday service choir took part in Awaken 2020, a prayer rally held at Sun Devil Stadium in Tempe, Arizona. And according to at least one news source, his announcement caused so many people to sign up that it caused their website to crash. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Eli, how do you manage to be so hilarious? Well, I'll tell you, natural talent is a huge part of it. But Eli, first yeah, story. So, oh, sorry. You might also be thinking this isn't particularly newsworthy. I mean, Christian artists play mega churches all the time. But some of the folks Kanye West chose to share the stage with might surprise you. I mean, not us or yeah, no. even you if you listen a lot. But <laughs> might surprise Kanye West. Yes, definitely. Him. <laughs> So, according to Right Wing Watch, attendees included Guillermo Maldonado, whose church recently hosted the president at a campaign kickoff for evangelicals for Trump. He has said that God raised up Trump as part of his end time plans for America, end quote. Yeah, and yes, by the way, you heard that right. A guy by the name of Guillermo Maldonado hosted a Trump campaign kickoff thing and and managed not to rape him the whole time. Yep. Also, fun fact, I learned just now that Odd Job retired from the Bond universe and became a Mexican pastor. So, <laughs> oh, he did. <laughs> I'm looking at the picture and he did. Yeah, no, actually, yeah, He's Google like, the picture. It's half it. Odd Job, half the guy from the Dunkin' Donuts commercial with the plane. <laughs> yeah. He's like side job, <laughs> hand job. So the event also included Shay Ahn, who is a promoter of Seven Mountains Dominionism, a mm. barely covered up ugly piece of anti-Semitism, which teaches that Satan, read mm. Jews, yeah. have control of many of the mountains of influence in society, like the media, <laughs> the government, etc. <laughs> and they're pretty sure that Jesus won't come back until Christian people conquer all those earthly realms and Take them away from Jew Satan. Mm -hmm. So there's a cult of Christians out there, pretty big one, and they're trying to figure out how to wrestle away control of the media and the government and education and like fire and air and wood and water and steam <laughs> or whatever. But, you know, until they learn to combine all the different karates into a hybrid master style, we should be fine. Yeah, right. That's no, happening. Let's be super clear here. They're not saying the Jews control the media and it's wrong for a religious group to secretly dictate what is and isn't available to the masses. They're saying, and damn it, we should get in on that, right? <laughs> we want a piece of yep. that. It's us. That evil thing that we're accusing someone else of doing, we would like to do, please. Yep, that's their whole thing. Uh, so yeah, quick reminder, when someone goes full religious and you hate to see it, they always, always bring the bigots with them. And quick, because if you think too long about how insane people are literally running the show right now, it becomes a really depressing comedy premise. We'll take a quick break and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucid. 
A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate race. It makes you a slut, right? Hey, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Misogyny. Okay, I know the guys already talked about this over on The Skeptocrat this week, but holy hell, if there's a more perfect encapsulation of American sexism, I can't imagine what it is. As you may have noticed, this year marks 100 years since women in America won the right to vote. And as you probably know intuitively, if you're not the president, that's when you celebrate the 100th anniversary of something. So anyway, among those getting in on the celebration is the National Archive, which has a whole display up about women's suffrage. And among the displays they have is a big picture of the 2017 Women's March. And look, as far as I know, that's still the largest political demonstration in human history. So it makes for a great picture. All they have to do is not mansplain to those ladies what their signs should have said. But they did. As Noah said, they quite literally erased the voices of women from history in celebration of women's suffrage. Seriously, they airbrushed out all of the references to Donald Trump at this anti-Donald Trump rally. They didn't add anything back in, by the way. The sign that said women against Trump was just left to say women against. As though the whole march was a celebration of being in the direction of and in contact with things. And that's just too perfectly emblematic of American sexism. It's fine for the ladies to march and assemble so long as no one has to listen to what they're saying. And as much as I'm normally a fan of the listen to what women are telling you strategy, this next story is going to have to serve as the exception. And that's because it's about a woman nobody should listen to urging people to listen to women nobody should listen to. This story comes to us from the friendly atheist and my arch nemesis, Lori Alexander. And it's about the proper response to fat shaming. So this all starts when fitness guru and fucking bitch Jillian Michaels of The Biggest Loser fame goes on a news program and makes jokes about Lizzo getting diabetes. And that sparked a lot of backlash and a serious conversation about the dangers of body shaming women. And Lori Alexander still hasn't met a social trend towards female empowerment that she didn't hate. So she decided to chime in and let everyone know that fat shaming is God's way of telling you that you're fat. Quote, eating too much makes us feel badly and affects our health. A lot of problems people are suffering from are due to their own negligence concerning their health and care of their bodies. End quote. And really, who better to diagnose than some condescending charlatan that's never met you? Anyway, I'm sure Lori is going to speak again soon, and that means I'm about to have brand new bullshit to review. So I guess I'll close it off there and hand you back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in Scotty from Marketing News tonight, the Atheist Foundation of Australia is jumping up and down and waving their hands back and forth, and not just because most of them are on fire, uh, because it turns out that instead of... You know, any kind of long term planning on how to not be on fire later or anything like that. Australian Prime Minister and comic relief sidekick in search of a super villain, Scott Morrison, <laughs> has been focusing his energy since he got back like. from the vacation that he took while his country was on fire on a religious freedom bill that sounds an awful goddamn lot like Rifra. Because Scott Morrison peered through the noxious miasma pouring forth from his smoldering nation to the United Goddamn States and said, yeah, yeah, like that. <laughs> and where's that tuba music coming from? It's like everywhere I go. I uh, And he starts like pacing around his office trying to find it. Okay. He starts going slower. What's happening? Seriously, who's doing that? All right. So in a striking moment of legislative honesty, this bill is being called the Religious Discrimination Bill Nailed and it. delivers on that <laughs> title. It would basically carve out an exemption to pretty much all law if you said you were breaking that law religiously. The Guardian actually put together this terrifying list of things that the government has confirmed would be protected under the proposed law, which is already in its second reading. And that list includes but is not limited to, quote, a woman may be told by a manager outside work that women should not be employed outside the home. What? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So they had a meeting to make this list and that's on it. Some guy was like, all right, so I'm leaving work with one of those fucking, you know, affirmative action lady workers that we had to hire. And I'm like, hey, you know, great work on the new project, Karen. One step outside of the office, you ambitious whore. So what do you guys think about it? that? Feels like. Right there, that would be the right place to draw the line. Mm -hmm. when yeah. We yeah, and someone else in that room was like, yeah, let's make that the law for sure. Yeah. 
Okay, Great. wait, there's more. How about a Catholic doctor may refuse to provide contraception to all patients or to prescribe hormone treatment for gender transition? Uh, okay. What about denying people life-saving medical care? Where's the line? Again, I am in we, gonna, all okay. of this. We're yes. having a line for that where there's you can mm -hmm. do that sometimes? Cool. Well, okay. So, so to be clear, though, this list that The Guardian put together was a list of all these different agencies that were against the law. We're writing to the government and saying, okay, well, wait, would this be legal? And then the government would have to sheepishly go, yes, that would be legal, too. And there's so much stuff in there about telling, like, handicap people that th their handicap is because God hates them or because they're sinful. All of that shit protected by this nonsense fucking law. Yuck. And look, this is a country where the most common answer on religious belief in their most recent census was none. Right. Even if you lump all the Christians together into one group, you still get the barest possible majority. So it's obvious why Christians are trying to quick codify their privileges while they still can. But it's a goddamn mystery why the majority of Australians would let them, especially when they're presented with the problems of Christian hospitals have to hire Jews sometimes. And the entire continent is on fire and will be for most of the foreseeable future and decide to really drill down on the former. <laughs> Yeah. And in Jersey, sure about that news tonight. In the state of New Jersey, if someone crawls in my bedroom window and tries to murder my unborn child, I have the legal right to squish their head like the mountain. But sadly, <laughs> the baby murderers of my state weren't feeling nearly that brave last week. So instead, they killed a bill that would end all religious exemptions for vaccination. Okay, but but Eli, aren't you from a religion based on just the principle of crawling into people's windows and vaccinating their stupid fucking plague children? I thought that you, I remember you mentioned I, that. I am now, yes. Yeah, so, that would oh, there we go. definitely work in Australia. So <laughs> impasse, you're both allowed to do your thing? In, yeah, it's a tie. So this story's been going on for a while now. Uh, last month, the state legislature delayed the bill while they tried to amended enough for those who thought the proper amount of baby death was some mm -hmm. but non zero as I said Great. yep they were looking for that non zero compromise but as I said last week it died during session one vote short of passage yeah yeah no the the fucking anti vax contingent had a whole kill the bill party afterwards uh, a bill is a, an immunocompromised gentleman that lives close to Eli. He's a, <laughs> yeah, very nice, sweet guy. <laughs> but, you know, fair's fair. So, yeah, great week to be a baby murdering idiot in my home state and still just perfectly legal, yep. which is especially ironic because our lawyer informs us that saying if my kid gets anything from one of these assholes or their little germ farm before he's old enough to be vaccinated, I will literally kill them is against the law. You can't say that, which is why I'm not saying it. I am just telling you it's legal to it's say that. And that legal, is legal advice portion of it. educational. <laughs> yeah, I'm helping. Great. Yeah. And to answer everyone's question, yes, Eli's already hired a team of Slavic nightclub bouncers with neck darts to surround his future baby at all times and vaccinate sure. anyone who comes within 500 feet. So. That's fine. <laughs> um, bonus, that. I've been shot several times already, so I definitely don't have measles. Yep. Or feeling in my toes. It's going great for me. Yep. Worth it. That said, State Senate President Stephen Sweeney is undaunted, saying almost, quote, we will continue to try common fucking sense <laughs> in the future. Cool. <laughs> and finally tonight. We have a story about the Bible, miscegenated zoo areas, and the British royal family. Uh-oh. And as you all know, there's a guy who has a Christian show dedicated to connecting those dots. So get ready for some Coach Dave Dobenmeyer. <laughs> nice. Fun fact, you can build your very own Coach Dave Dobenmeyer story with the formula random location plus 14th century belief, <laughs> plus news item. Try it at home. It's fun. It's a lot oh, of fun. Oh, no, I want to I want to play. Okay. Um, Coach Dave was at Jimboree mm -hmm. when he realized the reason you can't turn lead into gold mm. is Trump's impeachment trial. <laughs> yeah, no, wait, that tracks. Yeah, that could that be works. this week. Yeah. No, but... <laughs> 
We're not subpoenaing any evidence about alchemy for this trial. Fuck you. <laughs> We're not learning more about that. So um, <laughs> last time we heard from Coach Dave, he was literally explaining how the Bible's warning about the dangers of mixed race marriage was super important, but oft misunderstood. Well, I guess he was thinking about that and realized he didn't really tie that together very well. So he added, quote, how is the royal bloodline being poisoned? She's half black. The royal family is the seat of Christianity. What? We cannot deny the impact of the royal family on the waspy culture. Oh, oh, wow. It's like he heard me. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, Just let, <laughs> let him finish, us. Noah. <laughs> and the crown has now, for the first time, been infiltrated with a bloodline. And um, <laughs> this is where Coach Dave accidentally hears himself talking and stops in the middle of his show to be like, wow, whoever's talking right now is super racist. <laughs> Wait, is that me? Am, what, am I in my mom's basement covered in green sheets by myself talking and hearing Again? myself talk and now saying this? I think I might be racist. Am I still rolling? Fuck. But then he's like, Fuck you, ears, Dave. You're racist for saying that. And mouth, Dave, continues. <laughs> this infiltrator comes in, proud of her infiltration, proud of her multiculturalism. And what's that demon doing? Destroying and upsetting everything. Wow. Every tradition in that royal family. End quote. I mean. Exact quote. You know, I look, I like that Dave is embracing the whole I am the byproduct of antiquated traditions and inbreeding thing. I guess, like, you know, own it, Dave. But other than that, yeah. this story is disgusting. <laughs> the honesty. So my favorite part is the idea that Coach Dave, who looks like the mascot for a semi-automatic tape measure company, <laughs> is paying close attention to the gossip surrounding the British royal family. I would, I would watch a 24-7 video feed of this guy like the fucking Truman Show. Just hours of him LARPing royal weddings, playing all the parts himself, doing the stuff, <laughs> and then examining skin tones with a magnifying glass and then a bunch of weeping and then back to the LARPing. He is not maximizing his earning potential with his little <laughs> show there. Uh -uh. So all right, well, it looks like Heath has a business proposal to work on, so we're going to close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jim Tan Laundry. And when we come back, what? it's going to get Ursine up in this motherfucker. You said it. Is that a Jersey Shore <laughs> reference I just made? Jersey Shore reference, indeed. Your favorite show. When you're a Christian apologist, you have a lot of enemies. Math, history, logic, and physics are all arrayed against you. And while most apologists don't have the guts to take on the observable universe head to head, we learned long ago that Hillary Morgan Farrer isn't most apologists. So we're back for another chapter of her book, Mama Bear Apologetics, but it's been a minute. So Eli, can you get us reoriented? Yes. So for those of you who remember our last segment, First of all, I'm sorry. Second of all, we are now onto the final half of this book where we'll be debunking things like feminism and Marxism. And what? Hey, yep. And this week's villain is naturalism. The or world. As <laughs> universe. <laughs> yep. Observable universe is going to get debunked right now. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Cool. <laughs> yes. Or as Hillary Morgan Ferrer calls the chapter, my brain is trustworthy according to my brain. <laughs> Can't trust that brain. Amazing. Great. Yeah. She read Descartes and she was like, see, I'm right. He's saying I'm definitely right. I'm right. <laughs> Me. And, and look, I got to admit, I am so excited at the beginning of every chapter of this book. I just opened it up and I was like, what does Hillary think naturalism means? What basic ideas will she declare to be sacrilegious? It's a real hoot. That's oh, I'm, all I'm saying. I'm just excited to see her commit to writing a chapter without using her brain. It's way more honesty than I'm used to out of <laughs> apologetics. Yeah. This book is a pretty good argument for dualism. It really is. <laughs> So let's get started with Hillary's definition of naturalism. Spoiler, she will not be using the dictionary as a citation here. Or 
anywhere else in the chapter, quote, naturalism is the belief that natural causes are sufficient to explain everything in our world. And materialism is the belief that nature, that is material stuff, is all that exists. Material things can be studied with the five senses. Immaterial things, morals, the human soul, angels, demons, and God cannot. I mean, I look, I know she's not doing it on purpose, but the fact that she chose the term synonymous with not relevant to the discussion is accidentally brilliant. <laughs> it's pretty great. There. Yeah. But there's more. After spending a couple of sentences explaining that everything that can't be not not undone to be not proven to be untrue, she says, <laughs> quote, we'll never be able to measure our souls in a beaker and we'll never be able to put God under a microscope. <laughs> Very next sentence, naturalism is an untestable hypothesis that can be granted only on faith and uh, quote. Well, yeah, if if only there were some tangible benefits of science that could prove its utility by proxy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Hillary Morgan Fair, I'm holding two test tubes full of... Of Scrabble tiles. One for you, one for me. <laughs> now can we talk about epistemology using fucking words? Is that okay with you? No, no. You gotta you gotta pour them back and forth for a little while. She's no sucker. I got a lab coat. Do you want a lab coat? <laughs> yeah, I want a lab coat. <laughs> so uh speaking of faith, now Hillary is gonna tell us that we don't know what the word faith means. Yeah. Like all intellectually honest people do when they're Defining the word, quote, when naturalists use the word faith, they are not talking about what is traditionally understood as faith. We put faith in people and things that we have experienced that's, to be trustworthy. That's just another End definition. Quote. There's yep. two. Yep. <laughs> Again, no need for a dictionary citation here. Yeah. And also, she's a liar. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. Christian people have faith in God, just like they have faith in the uh, fucking FedEx guy who has the buzzer code to their building. It's the same thing. That's, yeah. that's true. <laughs> that's how they treat it. Okay. But now, now it's time to move on to the supernatural. Gentlemen, are you ready to go all the way to Crazy Town? Eli, we've been making left turns at Crazy Town Square since page one. That There's is no fair. deeper. There can't be a deeper. <laughs> oh, there is. Quote. The word supernatural has negative connotations within the scientific community. When people hear that word, their minds immediately conjure up images of psychics, aliens, or magic. However, the word supernatural simply means outside of nature. Nothing more, nothing less. She can't what? find an example. Like, she's like, it's not just psychic, magical, aliens. It could also mean God. The Space wizard that can read your <laughs> fucking mind. God damn. damn it. She continues, quote, God is supernatural to the universe. I love I love this sentence so much because I know the two of you had to read it. That's what makes me so happy. Quote, God is supernatural to the universe in the same way that I am super book to this book. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. This book perfectly describes <laughs> Hillary Morgan Farish. It's, it's just right. She is infrabuckle to this book. <laughs> so, yeah, with that uh, fancy newfangled definition of the word super, Hillary spends a paragraph or two talking about how Christians aren't like those crazy fuckers who believe in aliens. Here's my favorite quote from this. Quote, as Christians, we acknowledge the existence of human souls and supernatural beings like angels and demons, but not ghosts, end quote. Oh, good, good distinction. <laughs> yeah, she concludes, to be a diehard naturalist is to limit oneself to material tools only. I prefer the bigger toolbox. Well, yeah, right, because if you only <laughs> limit yourself to tools that exist, you're never going to know the chromoconstibulator readings. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Jesus. She's doing a chapter about her goddamn sky hook. Yep. <laughs> For her Indeed sky she hook. is. Yep. Very, very much. All right. So now it's time for a brief history of naturalism. New section in the book here. Bet it's not brief enough. Yeah. And here is how we're going to begin. Quote, the history of philosophy can be divided into three main periods. Pre-modern, 
modern and postmodern. Post -modern. Yeah. <laughs> I believe we are technically living post postmodern times, but um, it's not clear what we're supposed to call it. We are partial to the phrase post truth. As that appears in many sources. Wait, what? So, Hold on. I mean, first of all, four. That's four. Yep. She made a fourth one after she said there's three. She did. Yep. Also, fun fact, Hillary Morgan Fair, post-truth became a word literally to make fun of very exactly you and the people who go by faith instead yep. of reason and evidence. That's what yep. that word is exactly. for. Yeah. No, you are living post-truth. Yes. Okay. But if she's not right, then how come she has this awesome accompanying graph which has the <laughs> way that demonstrates that complex mathematical yep. concept of four yeah it, it know. has the <laughs> can you put this graph in a beaker eli i don't know <laughs> well, i believe graphs i would need to see a beaker or a test tube also you're, you're getting a tweet from hmo with that page ripped up into a beaker i'm just letting you know right now <laughs> he won't see it yeah so this graph it has the the four Three sections of history, <laughs> philosophy on one side, and then the sources of knowledge in the middle, and then the ultimate truth on the other side. And she has divided them thusly. <laughs> Pre-modernism's ultimate truth was God or gods. Modernism's ultimate truth was man's collective reasoning ability. Um... Postmodern's ultimate truth was trick questions, silly. There's no way to know for sure. And now his ultimate truth is strength of emotion and personal conviction. Uh, okay, wait, wait, wait. What about ultimate truth is a term made up by people who need there to be gradients of truth for their bullshit thing to work? Where does that land vis-a-vis -vis modernity? <laughs> Okay, Noah, she's talking about the super temporal. Open your mind for a second. <laughs> Infra book tempora. She Never actually mind. is. She is. Yeah. So. Right. So now she's going to literally describe pre-modernism as her worldview. But rather than acknowledge it, she moves as quickly as possible over to shit on modernism. So here's one of my favorite quotes from this section. Quote, the modernists moved beyond what they saw as superstitious nonsense. And to be fair, there was a lot of nonsense. For example, according to Greek mythology, the growing and winter seasons were attributed to the six pomegranate seeds Persephone ate while a prisoner of Pluto. <laughs> end quote. Why she can't find an example? Can you imagine <laughs> long dead ladies eating fruits determining the future? So <laughs> stupid. So super. Oh, so good. <laughs> She concludes her section on modernism, quote, evolution became the new religion with Darwin as its pope <laughs> and scientists as its priests. Yeah. And now post Darwin, post post yeah. truth, Darwin posts something. <laughs> so at this point in the book, she tries like a couple paragraphs where she's trying to do this metaphor about how science is like a failed relationship. She says, quote, Science became just as dogmatic and divisive as religion, and still is. I, I'm I'm always amazed how often they can claim that we're just as bad as them without realizing they just admitted they're bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she continues, and Darwinism morphed into social Darwinism, a deeply dehumanizing belief which taught that different races of people are at various stages of evolution. This horrific philosophy paved the way for supposedly scientific rationale for racism Godwin. and justified new and creative evils like eugenics and the there sickening experiments done on Jews during the Holocaust. Yep. There it is. Yeah, no, totally. That was the uh, Nazi rallying cry. They were just like, this is evidence-based and peer-reviewed. This is peer -review. never peer -review. Yeah, they, peer review. Perfectly large data set, big data. What? <laughs> Nothing to do with religion, let me tell you. So at the end of that sentence, she's got another footnote because she could tell you were going to be skeptical, Heath. And it is, first of all, it's David Foster Wallace-esque, but it reads in part, quote, it was the United States' application of Darwinism to purify the gene pool that was responsible for not only <laughs> planned parenthood, but also for the atrocities perpetrated by Hitler, end quote. Oh, he's oh. number two on the list. <laughs> that was the second problem. The U.S. Yeah. caused 
-hmm. Planned Parenthood, but also Hitler. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and a good thing Christians have been around for the last 2,000 years to make sure nothing bad happens to the Jewish people. (laughs) (laughs) Until until Darwin came along. Yeah. And wrecked it for him. Yeah. So that brings us to her summary of postmodernism, or as Hillary puts it, Enter postmodernism, which teaches that there is no such thing as absolute truth and nothing can be known. You know, it is hard to shit on postmodernism in a way that doesn't inspire me to just shit right alongside you. But something tells me she managed it. (laughs) Postmodernism says there's no absolutes. That's dumb. Everything is absolute. Nobody's (laughs) taught. She just said that. Yeah, so with all of philosophy nice and summed up and out of the way, it's time for practical implications of naturalism. And in this section, Hillary Morgan Ferrer is going to tell us the naturalistic answers to questions your kids might get and how loud you should scream to ignore them. And she starts with the question of, if God didn't create the universe, who or what did? Well, if you didn't stop yourself from beating your wife, who did? Yeah, right. Exactly. (laughs) And look, credit where credit's due. HMO's got a hot, hot new take here because her answer is the following. Quote, Mama Bears, listen closely when I say this. No. (laughs) Every hypothesis about origins is eventually reduced to something that one, has always existed, is eternal. Two, needs no creator, is self-existent. And three, is sufficiently powerful to create. Do not let anyone tell you that their first cause is more scientific than yours. None of us can recreate the beginning of the universe, so all of us must take our respective first causes on faith. What Did, did she just use postmodernism to justify her belief? Because I feel like she did. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, she has faith in her first cause, just like she has faith in her FedEx guy. Same thing. Yeah, yep. Yep, same, same, yeah, same exact thing. So, so then she breaks down some individual answers. She shits on Carl Sagan for saying that the universe has always existed. And, I shit you not, accuses him of ripping off Hebrews 13.8. What? Because it says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, she thinks the Bible... Coined the word same? Yeah. yeah and the the concept. And now she and I are both plagiarists for using it just now. <laughs> what the fuck? Obviously, yeah. You owe the Bible some money. So then she moves on to the second theory of creation that she believes is incredibly popular in science, which is that there are an infinite number of universes, which is not only not an answer to the question she asked, she doesn't even refute it. <laughs> She concludes, quote, if there are infinite universes, then where do they all come from? I kid you not. The answer is that there is a multiverse generator. And guess what properties it has? It is eternal, uncreated, and apparently capable of creating repeatedly. Please, someone explain to me how this is a simpler and less faith requiring hypothesis than belief in God, end quote. Okay, well, you want, since you asked, you want to take that? Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, God is that plus some shit. He plus bunch, some shit. Yep. A lot. A, lot, a lot, lot of shit. So, so this would be God minus some shit, and therefore would require you to have less faith or a faith in fewer things. Jesus, even when we let you define our positions incorrectly, you still can't refute them. You fucking idiot. She. <laughs> cannot. So with the origins of the universe thoroughly debunked, it's time for a section called, <laughs> okay, fine. We'll skip the universe. Where did life come from? And <laughs> her answer, by the way, is not spontaneous generation, motherfucker. In case that's what you were thinking. <sighs> it's not that, idiot. It's it's you don't know and I don't know, so I know part two. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. And I yeah. love that her section title is like part of an argument she was having with somebody and like, fine, fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're being a dick is the title of the beginning next section. The next chapter blocked on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what I should have said. <laughs> Arguments I've had in the shower. Chapter seven. Right. 
So then she shits on scientific consensus for a paragraph or two. She's like, oh, look at all this stupid shit scientists used to believe. And then it ends with this, quote, in the mid-1800s, French scientist Louis Pasteur conducted experiments that once and for all slew the behemoth of spontaneous generation. What? Thank you, Louis Pasteur, for putting that one to rest due to your faith in God informing your science. End quote. Oh, is that... Is that why he did that? Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's a cool story about the guy who had to invent a process to fix the poison milk that God created and told us to drink. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that out of the way, uh, again, this is Mama Bear Apologetics. It's time to roar like a mother. So first up, we're going to recognize the message. And according to Hillary, she's going to do that with the two most common ways you're going to see naturalism packaged. We're going to recognize those messages. So message one is the supernatural will eventually be explained away by science. I, I love the unrecognized arrogance of imagining that their bullshit is in need of more explanation than it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gets better because... The source of that message that she points out for this terrible lie is Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo? Oh, it is. It is Scooby-Doo <laughs> because none of the ghosts on that show turned out to be real. <laughs> she includes this section. I mean, all the characters in the show are in a show. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> she concludes this section, and I love this sentence because it's so fucking self-aware. A common tactic in the atheist community is to ask, can you tell me one thing that we originally thought was natural that turned out to be supernatural? There is no way for Christians to rebut this because naturalists <laughs> outright reject any evidence that appeals to supernatural <laughs> explanation. Yeah. I, I love that the end of that section is just like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Just, you know, try not to get asked that question. We lose. <laughs> we lose. Carry smoke bombs. Tuck and roll. Tuck and roll. <laughs> I'm so right. You can't even imagine what evidence for my position would look like. <laughs> and neither can I. <laughs> okay. So the second message <laughs> that you need to recognize to roar like a mother is nature is all there is. And sh she just says a bunch of true things in this section, but like sarcastically. Yeah. She's like, love is just oxytocin in the brain. But we're supposed to be like. Yeah, stupid. Everyone knows it's oxytocin in the brain and magic. <laughs> yeah. No, I deal this with, with this one all the fucking time. It's the all too familiar argument from the apologist's legally protected right to proceed any description with the word just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, just fucking stardust. I want. I was told I was going to yeah. be sentient semen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by the new guy. So now we're going to O offer discernment. Which, if you'll remember from the rest of the book, means <laughs> concede you're full of shit. And this acronym system is my favorite every time. It's I remember so that. goddamn yeah. bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and here she spends a couple of paragraphs explaining that she understands why naturalism is so popular because, you know, science results in cell phones and religion results in witch burnings. But <laughs> she's going to point out the lies of naturalism again. Anyway, cool. <laughs> in this section. Okay, so lie number one is science and Christianity are at odds. Yeah, uh, ever since we got past eugenics, we've been at odds with Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> Direct quote. Here's how she, she, so it literally is the title, science and Christianity are at odds. And then right below that, she has written false Naturalism and Christianity are at odds. What? Science and Christianity get along just fine. When you hear people make the claim that science and Christianity don't mix, ask them what they mean by science. If they give you a naturalist definition, ask them what experiment they did to get that definition. Uh, yeah. Um, right. Now, what experiment did you do to prove any words meant anything? You can't do that with a beaker, can you? Checkmate, atheist. Jesus fucking Christ. Every definition of the word science in every dictionary in the goddamn English fucking language defines it as essentially short for scientific naturalism. Not faith. Yeah. That's what it means. That's what those <laughs> words mean. Yep. The, and the experiment was catching one FedEx guy not being trustworthy. There you go. 
and, 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 for you. Look, the experiment was trying to fly with other fucking worldviews and then <laughs> trying to fly with this one. <laughs> A lot of squished guys. All right, so line number two. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're doing Ruhr. I'm going back for one more. Ruhr. I owe flying also. <laughs> line number two, science uses facts, religion uses faith. That's a lie. <laughs> Point number two, fuck you, Heath. You're being a dick. Yeah. <laughs> Again, right underneath that, false both science and Christianity are a mixture of facts and faith, as long as we are properly defining faith. Right. And well, yeah. And by properly, she means differently depending on what she needs it to mean on this side of the goddamn sentence. Yeah. So she concludes by going full Ken Ham and explaining that Christianity is based on science, too. It's just based on historical science. Oh, right. that and term. You can't repeat history. So it's just as good as regular science. Oh, yeah. For a second, I thought she was just regular pleading. But now it all makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that brings us to lie number three. Non-minds can produce information. Okay, she wrote that on a computer. <laughs> yeah. And I read it on one. It was great. Here's her answer, by the way. She she didn't think of computers. I mean, she didn't think of computers, She's but she says things about computers. Quote, a computer did not create computer language. A mind outside the computer created it. No, well, it's but uh, you look, you drop a fucking stick on the ground and that creates information. We don't need to bring silicone and circuit boards into this equation to debunk it. <laughs> so with R and O out of the way, it's time to argue for a healthier approach. And I cannot put it better than Hillary's own words when she says, quote, the main idea I would like you as a mama bear to remember is that science and Christianity are friends. And her proof of this, by the way, is that lots of scientists were Christian. Well, she just got done pointing out that lots of scientists were eugenicists. What are you trying to defend, lady? <laughs> lots of. And of course, to complete our roar, we're going to... Re God, I love this acronym so much. For complete our roar, we're going to reinforce through discipleship, <laughs> through discussion, discipleship, and prayer. Really? I have another argument that I will go with next. Robert Loja. Right oh. in your face, Robert Loja. <laughs> reinforce Rabbit. Robert Loja. No. <laughs> so she's got two examples on how to reinforce this. Have your kids draw a picture. This is a real quote. Have your kids draw a picture. When they are done, ask them, how did that picture get there? Was it you or was it the crayon? The answer is both, end quote. <laughs> and that is just like God. What well, You see? <laughs> end of example. <laughs> Her second example and is... And that's why gay people shouldn't be allowed to get married. There <laughs> exactly. You go. Great. Her second example is, quote, Talk to your kids about the correct definition of faith, end quote. You know, the one you don't find in the dictionary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, then, of course, there's the new section, which we got introduced to last time, the pause for prayer, P-A-W-S, which, again, it's just like a weird prayer she wrote to God in the middle of her chat. It's like a bad BDSM scene. And anyways, now it's time for the discussion <laughs> questions, gentlemen. Wait, is pause also an acronym or is it just a bad pun? No, no, I think it, that would be acronyms bear. all the way down. She couldn't handle it. Okay. It's just bear. <laughs> it's just it's just bear. All right. Number one, icebreaker. What is something in nature that has always left you amazed? Oh, um, that fish that swims up your dick hole and kills you. I feel like that's where all discussions of intelligent design should start, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh for me birds yeah. my favorite one is the bat finches yeah. <laughs> two main theme science is a gift from god but people have used it to replace him what are some ways that people have tried to use science as a replacement for god oh actually i know this one uh making things objectively happen and or gaining knowledge <laughs> yep <laughs> Also, eugenics. It's weird she brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> How God was already on top of that, and then yeah. science stole it. Yeah, did. 
Number three, self-evaluation. It is tempting to think too high or too low of scientific discoveries. Which way do you tend to lean? Why? What is a healthy view of science? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm right down the middle on this one. I believe half the science. <laughs> I go like every other science thing to be right, healthy. Yeah. Everything, yeah. every other thing they discover, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Every, I do the odds. <laughs> it's good. The odds. Yeah, I do the super. evens. It's do so you? crazy. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> you gotta, the key is you got to play the spread. That's how you really get all the best science. Uh, number Gonna four. Murder you, you even bigot. <laughs> <laughs> we are just as dogmatic as Same them. Thing. She was My right God. the whole time. God damn it. <laughs> Little did we know. Converted by Mama Bear apologies. Show me a beaker of even numbers and then we can talk, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> and murder your children. What do you mean, two beakers? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number four brainstorm this is a real quote by the way this one is hard is it <laughs> Br like brainstorming is hard it's, it's, it's all the, the brainstorming that's the is no hard. wrong answers section of coming up with stuff that's hard <laughs> go ahead Hillary. Yeah. look again at the differences between pre-modern modern and post-modern mindsets really dig into culture can you identify parts of culture that operate under pre-modern rules? <laughs> Which ones are modern? Which ones are postmodern? How can you tell? If this is too hard, save the question till you're done with chapter 10. <laughs> if this concept is still a little fuzzy, feel free to use outside sources. <laughs> I love how shamelessly pre-modern she is, right? Because that's what this is. That's just, it's just her going like, my thoughts come from when we didn't know about gases and we thought disease was caused by lust, y'all. <laughs> Yeah, well, for me, uh, number four here was too hard. I'm saving that question. Oh, for okay. Later. Fine. Yeah, go <laughs> to chapter ten. Chapter you come it's back. Good that you offered that. <laughs> Revisit <laughs> number five. Release the bear. Go on a nature walk with your kids. Yeah, or you know, just by yourself if you're Hillary. Warren. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Or Heath. Yeah. <laughs> Find as many things as you can that are beautiful. Make a study of God's creation a part of your everyday life. Emphasize that science is a means to study what God made, but could never explain the purpose of his creation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that whole field of science about the purpose of God's creation is pretty silly. That's a, that's a dumb field. All right, that well, a test tube, idiots. While Hillary goes off to find out if the bear shits in the woods once and for all, we're going to shelf this book for another month, but we'll be back soon because she still has to do feminism, y'all. <laughs> yeah, she does. Before we cue the copyright notice this week, I want to remind you that if you're trying to keep up with all the us that you can, your best bet is to follow at PIAT Pod on Twitter. If you have a question that you want answered on this show, that is the best place to ask it at P-I-A-T pod. That stands for puzzle in a thunderstorm, but that was too long. So we shortened it. Anyway, that's all the blessing we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, we had to look out for a brand new episode of our sister show's hot friend got off a movie stay being at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday and an even new episode of our half sister show citation needed they being at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, my mouth can't stop sound making until I've thanked Heath Enright for being the wind beneath my wings. Eli Bosnick for being the wind over my wings, which is every bit as important if you understand how lift works. I need to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Illusions for being the wing below and above my wind or something. I, it worked better in my head. I also want to thank Natalie from Nebraska for writing this week's Farnsworth quote and that depressing reminder that so little of humanity finds humanity worth studying. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people, Audrey Pine Snake, Andromeda Cummer, John Boy, Jacob, John, Gary, Matthew, Caleb, Alexander, Trevor, Danica, Karen, Kite Ellipsis, Terry, Bad Sport, and Kimmy. Audrey Pine Snake, Andromeda Cumber, John Boy, and Jacob, whose wits are so sharp, scissors warn their kids not to run with them. John, Gary, Matthew, Caleb, Alexander, and Trevor, who have moistened more sexy bits than most commercially available lubes. And Danica, Karen, Kite Ellipsis, Terry, Bad Sport, and Kimmy, who are so bright they're allowed to go through the tunnel with their headlights off. Together, these 17 saintly secularists satiated our ceaselessly slackening supply of specie this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the medium of exchange it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathing atheist, whereby you'll earn 
early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but you don't even know what the fuck specie means, you can also help a ton by leaving us a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. The legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark. We also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you can find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Oh, that's correct. The comments yeah, so are where they should be on this, this one. Well, they're harder to read. They should do a. Ba- they should have a bigger font for the commas. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright twenty twenty. All rights reserved.